My name is Lexi LeBan. Thank you all so much for coming to our post-screening panel discussion with our esteemed panel. I'm not going to say much, but um, I'm just really honored to be here. I want to thank Spark Arts for ha hosting us here today in this really cozy and fabulous space. So we'll be like Miss Bucha here together, all huddled together. Um, and I want to just let you know we're filming here uh, the panel. So if people, don't, if some people don't get in, um, we would love to broadcast out to the rest of the community and send the link to the video so everybody can see the panel discussion. And then we have Barack here doing still photos. So those will be posted on our Flickr page afterwards if you want to check them out. Um, I. You know, we all came from the film at the Castro, and this year it was our idea to follow the panel with um, a discussion about intersectionality in the Women's March, and I couldn't think of a better person for hosting this panel than my dear friend and colleague, Alana Kaufman. Um, I actually texted her from the Sundance Film Festival when I was watching this film and asked her to partner with me. She was on a train, I think, going from DC to, I don't know where, New York, um, going through a tunnel and saying, oh, it sounds great. Let me get back to you on the other side of the tunnel. So this panel has been in the, in the works for a really long time, and I'm really going to turn it over to Alana because she's an expert and she's going to introduce herself and the panelists and then we will have time to open it up for questions at the end. I think what we've decided is people will write their questions on cards and, and then pass them to our volunteers. So without further ado, please let's welcome the director of the Jews of Color Field Building Initiative, Alana Kaufman. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here and for watching the film with us. It's a real privilege uh, to get to host this conversation on behalf of the Jewish Film Institute. Um, and Lexi, thank you for the invitation. Um, this was the second time I got to watch the film. Oh, let me just, my name is Alana Kaufman. I um, direct the Jews of Color Field Building Initiative. We are a national initiative and we focus on three areas. We run, um, our work is to advocate for and center the voices and experiences of Jews of color in the United States. There are 7.2 million Jews in the United States of which well over 1 million are Jewish people of color. Right. Um, and so much of what we have going on in the United States about moving into a multiracial community is also happening in our Jewish community. And I think we saw themes of, of um, opportunities to connect and also opportunities to, con to divide in the film that we also see both in the United States in general and the Jewish community in specific. And this is an opportunity for us to come together and grapple about what it means to be in movements where people are different, where we sometimes disagree, and where we also have to focus on a common enemy. In this case, I would suggest it's white nationalism. Um, and how do we do that in a context where we are traditionally used to seeing really white folks, and in the Women's March case, white women lead? And what does it mean to decenter whiteness, to decenter power, and to reallocate and redistribute that in a way that represents who we are as, as American women? as a nation of women, as in a nation of citizens that have to be focused on a greater, greater good, which is our collective freedom. Um, Erica and Diola, liberation is our flag. Um, liberation is our flag. And what do we need to do as a collective and as a community to be able to be free, particularly when we live in a context where resources, power, privileges are inequitably allocated and inequitably held onto for the sake of, of tradition? And how do we find our new tradition in a way that reflects the diversity of who we are so that we can be in community together? And that's what this conversation will be about. Um, it's oh, maybe like, and it's gonna get hot in here, and so you might wanna. So it's funny, like I get to introduce a lot of panels um, and a lot of experts and a lot of speakers. And Lita, can I have a little piece of tissue to death? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
And, and it's funny because in these contexts where I get to interview people, uh, something happens when we introduce women of color, which is we tend to put forward like our professional accomplishments to create like a context where people will give us some, some kavod, some community respect. And so I was gonna start off by like listing Lely's accomplishments and her professional acumen and like your different sort of awards and things. And I was going to introduce Tonda and Becca in that way. But the purpose of our time together is not to prove who we are. The purpose of our time together is to get into conversation. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce you all just with a couple few words. Um, Lely Erlinda Devari as a colleague and friend, a, a leader in our Jewish community, her own version of a Women's March activist, and somebody who focuses on how to connect people to create waves of change. And so Lely will bring some of that to us this afternoon. Tonda Case. Um, Tonda Case is also, a, she's, a, she's a board leader of some of our esteemed organizations. She works with many of our colleagues out there. Um, and Tonda also is a holder for us of community culture and is like the Masters of Business Administration of Community Care. And Tonda's focus in her work is to make sure that we don't put strategy before connection and that we don't lead with our heads in the absence of our hearts. And Tonda will bring that to us this afternoon. And I wanna, oh, and uh, Lady Steele is here and I wanna welcome you. Um, and I wanna introduce Becca Sharp. Her parents are here, thank you for being here. Um, and Becca, leadership comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes and voices. And leadership without connecting to our children and our young people is leadership without purpose and focus. And Becca's work is around making sure our young people have vision and they have hope and they have capacity and skills. And Becca focuses on that so that we can focus on other things. And so I want to invite Becca into the room and thank you for being here. All right. The Women's March brought up a lot of issues for us. And the one I want to sort of bring into the room is this concept of intersectionality. And I want to bring it to the room because I want to take away this idea that there's a competition, right? Like, if I'm too black, then I can't be very Jewish. Or if I lead with my feminism, somehow I'm going to squash my ability to advocate for my sense of democracy or civic engagement and civic rights. Intersectionality is not a threat to the Jewish community. Intersectionality is an invitation and a concept to enable us to be whole as we become our multiracial, multiethnic, multigenerational selves. Each one of us in the room brings with them a sense of faith, a sense of race, a sense of ethnicity, a sense of physical and mental abilities, talents, passions, and each one of those variables, each one of those elements makes us whole. And not one of those elements taken away will allow us to be who we are or will allow us to be in our power. And so this idea of intersectionality, that we are of multiple facets of identity, and those multiple facets not only are allowed to be integrated at the same time, but in a moment, for example, where who we are as women is elevated be before or ahead of who we are as women of color, when women of color have not had the opportunity to excel or succeed, then we need to be conscious of that, of that. And we need to be aware of what it means when some people have been able to move ahead while others have not, and make space. I want to encourage each one of us to assume that we can be Jewish, people of color, queer, differently abled, differently inspired, of different faiths, and be whole all at the same time, and only if we do that can we work on our collective liberation and together take on our common enemies. So with that and that introduction, I wanna welcome you all here. We're gonna have a little storytelling, we're gonna ask some questions and we're gonna open it up to the audience. Laylee, Tonda, Becca, each one of you 
participated in a women's march, the women's march, in some different way or form. Tonda, will you start us off with your women's march story? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you owe me. <laughs> okay, so um, I am not, sure, I am not necessarily one to go out and do a whole lot of marching. That's not my get down. Um, I, I work in the background primarily. I have always been much more comfortable working in the background. You need something done, I'll handle it. But I don't want to be in front. And over time, and uh, it, that's changed. And so I got a phone call from Yavila McCoy, who heads Dimensions out of Boston. And she said, I need you. We're doing this work. It's the Women's March. And I said, oh, no. Um, OK. And with all of the different things that had been you know, said in particular about Tamika Mallory, Linda Saucer, women who you know, are heading this beautiful, amazing march. I had, to, I had to figure out where I fit in, not necessarily, it wasn't necessarily my Jewishness that was, in, you know, that I was grappling with this question through. It was more the idea that I did not necessarily feel that marches I don't want to say that they were not important because of course they are, but I just didn't feel like I had a place in that platform, if that, if that makes sense. Um, and so I actually went into deep meditation and prayer. Um, I fasted. I got very quiet. And in a moment of great, um, I want to say anguish, I, I wound up um, hearing the voice of my grandmother, who my grandparents were um, activists in St. Louis, Missouri. So I was raised by activists. I watched my grandparents um, make great sacrifices for others. I remember times when people didn't have food and my grandmother would get a phone call and the next thing I knew, she was calling all of her homies to say, you need to make this, make this, make this, make this, so that we can feed this particular family. So that those are the people I come from. And that's the kind of work I'm used to doing. And then I realized that my hands and my heart and my feet and my presence, that was another kind of prayer and another kind of doing and feeding. I was feeding souls, in particular feeding my own because I didn't realize in that moment how hungry and starved I was to be in community, to be rallying, to hear my own voice in the voices, you know, it, along with the voices of others in a real powerful and meaningful way. And so this group of Jewish women of color came together and we were online, we were making you know, relationships, we were reaching out to Ilana all over the country. There were women of color. I would get online at 2 a.m. and somebody else would be in the document. So, and then you're like, girl, what you doing up? Why you, what, you know, aren't you supposed to be in the bed? Don't you have to go to work tomorrow? So we were, you know, like this went on for the months in preparation. You know, the resources came, the people, and the people came. Everybody wanted to be a part of this. And so we led this, this group, Jaywalk Marching, Jewish Women of Color Marching, hashtag Jaywalk Marching, we led the DC Women's March. And it was unprecedented. And there was something about being in the sea of women and these voices and men and children and folks just rallying and I look to the left of me and I look to the right of me and there are all of these women that I have been in relationship with in so many, you know, for so many years in this deep and meaningful way and we are doing the fight and doing the work of fighting for liberation. And it took my breath away and I haven't been the same since. And so I see myself and my role in this work differently now because I was able to step out of what was comfortable for me and claim my power in a way that I hadn't necessarily thought to claim it before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know about the cry. So <laughs> we got the toilet paper. 
Becca. <laughs> you were there too. Yeah, and before I get started, I just want to say that uh, we are standing on Ohlone land. Um, and the region known that we're standing on in San Francisco is uh, called uh, Ramatush Ohlone, which is the language spoken by the people who were here and some of whom are still here. Um, or it's also called Yelamu, which refers to, uh, which means west refers to the Yelamu Ohlone who live west versus the Chechenyo Ohlone who live in the, in the East Bay. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so I was at the 20, that was this year, yeah. wow, <laughs> at the 2019 Women's March. I think it was a week before when I got an email from, Ra from Rachel Faulkner and who was one of the organizers, and she said, could you come to the Women's March in DC? Um, because I had, there was a photo campaign of hashtag jaywalk marching, um, where we were posting pictures of Jewish women of color. And yeah, and I honestly, I didn't really know what it was about at first. I was, I thought it was just um, making ourselves visible, and I also was sort of out of out of the loop with the allegations of anti-Semitism by the Women's March leaders. But then I get this email from Rachel, and I told her, "Sorry, I don't I, I don't live in Philadelphia anymore. I don't think I can make it." And then she said, "No, we'll we'll fund your flights." So six days before the Women's March, I find out I'm going to DC. <laughs> and I couldn't, I remember I couldn't request a uh, work off in time, so I end up taking a red-eye flight um, and fly in about two hours before the march started. I didn't get that much sleep. And I go to services, I say hi to some people I haven't seen in a long time. I say hi to Tonda. And my good friend, um, Rabbi Mira Rivera, uh, she's the first Filipina, Filipina American woman to be ordained at JTS in New York City. She led services, and then we start marching. And we're marching from, I forget what the church was called, where we had services, and we're marching down to where there's a huge crowd of people. And we have a security detail, and I'm wondering, why do we have a security detail? And we're marching down the hill, and then also keep in mind the, the Parsha that week was Parshat, forgetting the name, it's the Parsha where the sea parted. So we get up to this crowd of people, and I could hear him, and he yells, everyone make way, and he parts his arms, and the people <laughs> parted. And I was like, and the banner was in front, and there were these three little girls, like this tall, with their signs, also pretty sleep deprived, along with me. And um, uh, Shahana McKinley is holding the Torah next to me, and we're going through the crowd. So I turned to my, my friend Sabrina Sojourner, Chazan Sabrina, and I asked her, where are we going? And she said, to the front. And I'm so tired, I'm clueless. So I said, wait, to, to the front of what? And she said, no, no one told you we're, we're leading the march. And I said, and inst my first reaction was just fear because here we were, it must have been a good hundred of us, women of color, leading the march. There was women of color in the front and the white, Jew and the white Jews in the back. And we were just so, visible. I was wearing my talis. Um, Shahana was carrying the Torah and these three little girls and I felt scared. And in my mind I'm thinking, wait, but if we're in the front, then people will see us. <laughs> and then I think to myself, it might myself on two hours of sleep and no coffee. It's like, oh wait, that's I get it, that's, that's why we're here. Okay, so I keep, we keep going, we get to the front. 
the march somehow started without us. I'm still pretty unsure about how that happened. And then we're running along the march corridor to take our place in the front. And I remember, I'll end with this, I just remember someone saying behind me, she took out her phone and she said, wow, you don't get this view that often. And I asked what? And she said, you don't get this view from the front that often. <laughs> so I took out my phone. And the moment I took out my phone, this man tried to break through the line of cameras that were up in front. And we just yelled him out. We just kept cheering. And that's, that's what really sticks in my mind from that day. Lely. Yes, for the for the people on the and also start us off because were you with Tonda and Becca in DC? No. No, I held down in Oakland. Who is here Whoa. at the Oakland? Whoa. 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 Um so I want to start by saying for the last three years I've been the Bay Area organizer for Ben the Ark, Jewish Action. And on a number of occasions, I've been asked to do speaking engagements and so forth, and, and there's an immediate hesitation for me, because of who I am, because of my identity, to not want to be in the front line, to not want to be center. Um, it's rooted in, in a lot of things, rooted in the, in the way that I was raised and the systems of oppression that I was raised. But that aside, um, when Oakland's Women's March reached out and said, we want Ben the Ark, we want someone from Ben the Ark to speak, I immediately thought, oh, I'll get one of our leaders. Like, I'm going to ask Tonda. I'm going to ask, Be like, many leaders that I can ask. But I'm happy, but all my leaders were in D.C., so I was literally left with no one other than white Jewish women. And I want to be really clear that I, this was a moment where I hold deep, deep relationships with white Jewish women. They are part of my community. They are part of my personal life and professional life. And in this moment, I knew it was necessary for this one speaking engagement that a Jewish woman of color speak. Um, who knows a, name, a woman by the name of Susan Lubeck? No? Yeah. My director, a very dear mentor of mine, when I checked in with her, I told her, Susan, all my leaders are going to DC. I got no one. And she reminded me what Tamika Mallory said in the film, that um, like, there is no other leader like, other than me. Um, and I needed to take this opportunity to do it. And I was filled with fear. I did not want to get up and speak. I was afraid, would I say the wrong thing? Would I cause more pain to my black brothers and sisters? Would I cause more pain to my Jewish community? Um, and so I also thought about it. And the next day, I think I reached out back to Women's March, Oakland Women's March. I think I, I was super late because I was trying to buy some time. Oakland Women's March kept pinging me. We need you, like, who's going to speak? Who's going to speak? Until finally I said, it's going to be me. And I want to I wanna share that one of the reasons, and I'm seeing my uncle Orlando, one of the reasons that I decided to do it um, was because of who I come from, that I stand on the backs of my grandmothers, both my grandmothers, who, if they were alive today, would, would see me and because of the sacrifices that they both made, that I am actually able to be the woman that I am today. Um, and that meant a lot for me. And so I named, at the very beginning, I, I, I named that I was bringing my grandmothers, both my, my Mexican and my Iranian grandmother, with me that day at the march. Um, and the last thing I will say is, um, it was important to me that before I could even begin the process of being a part of collective liberation, it actually had to start with my own liberation. Um, that if I am to live my full authentic self and be a part of this movement, that I actually had some work to do on myself. Um, and speaking at the Women's March was definitely um, a step towards my own liberation. So I will end there. Thank you all. Um, but I'm just going to ask. Uh, Lely, when you were at the Women's March, you wore a kippah. Becca, I know that you recently were bat mitzvah, mazel tov, and you wore your talis. Tanda, you lay Torah at my daughter's bat mitzvah. So how do you square your engagement with the Women's March with 
what we hear are perspectives of anti-Semitism. Any one of you jump in. How do you square your own participation and engagement with the Women's March with the observations or perspectives of anti-Semitism that we've heard? Um, I'll start. I, I, I find that, I think it's such an interesting question because, you know, like, I don't have sense enough to feel like I have to square anything. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't go through the process of hitting the places that are compartmentalized by the world that are my life. My life gets to be fluid. And so then when I choose to do a thing, I get to come in my full glory. So I don't feel that I have to, and a part of it I'm sure has to do with age, right? Like once you get past 55, you know, you can say what you want to say. And I advocate that everybody get past 55 so you can say what you want to say and do what you want to do, right? So like I, I just don't, I just didn't feel, you know, that, that idea of intersectionality for me is just my life. It's just my life. When I show up at shul, I bring that, all of this with me when I show up in worship and when I when I think about anti-semitism anti and how to so as a as a Jew by choice I that is a part of of what I chose when I chose Judaism I chose to take on the good the bad and the ugly I expect to experience the good the bad and the ugly right and so my I feel like my experience as um, as a black woman walking in this world through the 1960s and on through today has prepared me in so many ways to, to understand, fight against, place anti-Semitism and even like break it down. Like I try to break down things that happen and get very granular so that I have a real clear understanding of what I'm dealing with. It's not just the words I hear and it's not just the act actions I either witness to, to or by others, but also as it lands on me. And I think it's just the good sense, the insanity of whatever it is, uh, the, the privilege, really of being able to walk in this life liberated and free. And that is a powerful thing because then there's some, when you start having questions around anti-black racism, anti-Semitism, ageism, you know, mental health, whatever, you know, like mental health challenges, physical challenges, emotional challenges, I can take those things on in my full self. I don't have to compartmentalize. Repeat the question one more time, Alana, just to like center myself. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start first by naming that for me, my understanding is that multiple truths can exist in harmony. Um, and so, my identity being fully Mexican-American, fully Iranian-American and Jewish, don't negate each other in any way. Um, they exist fully in me at all times and even through me. And so um, what was happening for me is that my identity is once I was reading, all, like, like so many of us reading online, um, the allegations, all of these identities within me were for the first time really coming into intention and, and not knowing I myself, not knowing how to, how to respond. Um, and so the first thing for me, the first thing I needed to do um, was remind myself like what is urgent? What is most urgent? Um, go back to my values. And for me, the liberation that I need to focus on, like who I am, um, that black liberation comes first for me. Um, and so with that, with that ability to read through what was going, what was happening with the, with the allegations of the Women's March, um, and understand how my Chicana identity had not been at the forefront of black liberation, 
how my Iranian American identity had not been at the forefront of black liberation. That was not the work that I had prioritized. Um, and so just being aware of, of this, actually then um, I was able to show up and have really, really difficult conversations within the Jewish community, primarily within the white Jewish community of like why it was that much more necessary to stay in relationship um, and to not target Tamika Mallory. Um, Something else I wanted to talk about was, um, oh, the Jewish woman of color. Of I was actually really surprised that the, that the director didn't, didn't highlight that at the very end we read that um, the steering committee for the National Women's March included three Jewish women. What the director didn't name was that two of them were black Jewish women. Um, and so I think that's important to name. The, also, like the Jewish woman of color contingent that marched, there's 100 women who were there, that was not highlighted at all. And I think that's a, that's a missed opportunity as well for, um, for, the, for the director. Um, I think I'll end there. Thanks. Okay, can you say it one more time? <laughs> In your own experience about engaging in the women's march, how did you, do, how did you also hold or receive Okay. Um, so honestly, I was pretty not removed, but unaware of the allegations of anti-Semitism, and I only started um, learning about it and learning what happened after the Women's March. Um, I was into my second year of teaching, so at the time, so yeah, overall I, I just wasn't, I just wasn't aware at the time and um, yeah, and I guess my feelings, like even after I got back from the Women's March um, and I learned about the allegations and also read the Women's March um, the statement denouncing anti-Semitism and racism. I feel that the part in the film with the with the rabbi in Brooklyn talking with talking with Tamika, talking with uh, Tamika and her sharing the pain that she felt really res really resonated with me. And, the pain that I felt, I just, honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't understand why, why they just couldn't denounce and say no until, I mean, until I, until I watched, the, until I watched the film. And for me, it's important to remember that the other side, well, I feel like the goal, not the goal, what am I saying? <laughs> um, they want to divide us, okay? They want, they want to divide us, and Ilana, what you were saying earlier about wholeness, and Layla, what you were saying about showing up as fully as, as yourself. Um, my whole life I have been told that I am half this and half that. I am half Chinese and half Jewish or half Asian or half white and which has led me to never feel enough. Me never feel enough or never be enough for others. And so the Women's March has allowed me, has really empowered me to show up as my true self and be unapologetic about it. And just combat this, combat their efforts to just divide to divide us by if we're Jewish or we're black or we're white and hold 
hold those all those identities at once. I forget where I I forget where I started. <laughs> um, because when they divide us, as we saw from the 2016 election, when they when they divide us and and put and put it as us against them, they win. They've been winning, and I feel like that's why the Women's March is so important and living in contradiction and having those conversations between the rabbi and Tamika are so important and so important because we but El Pueblo Unido Jamás Será Vencido what we heard throughout the whole film the people united will never be divided so I'll end with that Um, I was sitting here listening to, to um, my sisters, and something came to mind. Um, I, I actually am very um, much like Tamika Mallory. And when I say that, what I mean is my experience. My father, um, um, of blessed memory, um, was a part of the Nation of Islam. And so when, at, when she was asked by the rabbi, and they were in conversation, and the, and the rabbi said, well, what do you, how do you feel about your Jewish brothers and sisters? After she had already said, I, you know, I disagree with these things, and she had made her point, and she has, her work should stand for itself. There was a part of me that was very angry um, with the rabbi, you know, for the way that she did, what Tamika said was not enough. There was an extra layer of, proof needed. And I have to also say that it reminded me and it raised up in me of the feeling that I had during conversion when the idea of going before three white men to after I had given my children, my time, my love, my commitment to the Jewish people, 10, 12 years before I converted, kept kosher, um, you know, wrapped my head, had done the whole nine, pulled the sleeves on, brought the collar up, did the whole nine, right? Before I converted, before I jumped the broom. And I remember feeling like, what more do I need to do? Why do I have to go? And I recognize also that that was the process. Like, I'm not saying that it was a special process made for me. But what I am saying is that there is something that sits in me low all the time around the idea that when I bring my full self, it is not enough, and that I yet have to prove, and that I yet have to do, and that it, it, I also have to explain how, as a black Jewish woman who is queer, you know, with a husband and two kids, what all of this means and how I have to show up. I'm constantly in the process of having to prove where I looked at Tamika and I thought, girlfriend, I know your pain, right? Because it is just a constant. And her initial words and her work, her 20 years of work was not enough for, for the rabbi to know how she felt about her Jewish brothers and sisters because her life had proven how she feels. She's in relationship with you, Dianu. So yeah, I just wanted to, to speak to that. Can I? What's your next question? Maybe I'm going to answer it. Oh, hold on, oh, hold on, hold on. I mean, or maybe the Jewish different. tradition. What's your next question? Because I'm already going to answer oh, it. Yes. I want to respond, but it may come up. So I'm going to hold off. Well, I was just going to add that. Then I think what's coming up for me is that um, it, what's coming up for me is what is so incredible about the women's march is. Um, it is one example of how Dove Kent is a Jewish white woman working out of the East Coast who's been doing racial justice work for years now. And she talks about how racism is a fight against anti-Semitism. Immigrant justice work is a fight against anti-Semitism. Transphobia work is a fight against anti-Semitism. That like the, like, it's not just, it, we, we can't actually just combat anti-Semitism on its own. And it, it actually speaks to solidarity work. Um, and the last thing I will say, because I, oh, the last thing I will say is um, Barbara Smith talks about how um, 
in movement building work in relationship, if we're not being challenged, then we're actually not doing the work correctly. So I'm really paraphrasing that probably very incorrectly, but that's my biggest takeaway is that in relationship across lines of differences, different lived experiences, I expect to be challenged. I expect to be even emotionally triggered. Um, and I actually do need to stay in relationship um, because my understanding is that white nationalism, um, that lives matter, um, not only black lives matter, migrant, migrant lives matter as well. And so um, like that's, that's why I, um, that was my understanding, one of my takeaways. That's all I wanted to add. point of process there are cards going around to start collect questions because there are going to be some of the same questions and so I want to be able to group those and I also want to micromanage the process a tiny bit so I want to be transparent with you um, and so like we're gonna do all of this together at once and then like as the flow opens up we'll do some more like dynamic questions and answers and so like if you think I'm trying to micromanage the situation I am um, and we will have some free-flowing conversation in about seven or eight minutes, and so bear with us. Um, thank you. I was struck by Rabbi Timoner's use of language, like, in it with you, or we are in it together rather than we are of the movement, and we are of the work. And I was struck by her use of language that from my perspective, felt very us and them. It felt very um, like we have done all of this for you, black people, and I feel hurt because you won't denounce Farrakhan. And I'm wondering, in a context in the United States where I'll just use the term violence, there's violence against black and brown people, disproportionate violence, disproportionate violence against our trans sisters out there, disproportionate violence against those who are undocumented, even though this is native land upon which we sit and stand all the time. So I'm struck by this context in which people are disproportionately affected by either the power or the absence thereof. And I'm wondering in a context where even in our most, when we try to be in relationship and in alliance, it's very much us and them, or we do things for each other rather than we're part of something together. What, is it, what are the elements of successful movement building? What does it take to be in relationship as people who are different fighting for a common, a common good? What, talk to us about it. When we're in proximity um, with others, like that's where the, re that's where the work starts. Um, so asking myself the first time I heard Brian Stevenson speak, um, who am I in relationship with? Who am I in relationship? Who am I not in relationship with? Um, how, are, how are the relationships that I have with people who look like me, um, think very similar as I do and so forth? And then just evaluating from there. That was, that was probably my biggest takeaway from hearing Brian Stevenson. And I actually think it starts there. Um, I think also part of the work that I've done on myself is my own um, anti-oppression work, right? Everything that I understand in getting a stronger sense of um, the, ra the way in which race um, plays out on a daily on a daily basis for myself and for others. Um, I think in, in having the more, having confidence in being able to name out um, when isms are playing out either in life, work, et cetera. Um, one thing that kept coming up for me is when hearing the, watching the inner, the, um, the dialogue between the rabbi and Tamika is how, how so many times, even in, in my own family, when I hear racism, transphobia, et cetera, et cetera, how it is my responsibility to call it out. It is absolutely my responsibility to do that work along with family and friends. Um, and we each, let's not lie about it. Like we each have that work to do in our own personal circles. Um, and that's who I am held accountable to. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, to share that. Yeah. asking about um, what are the successful elements of movement building 
in a context where there's disproportionate, and the term I use is violence, um, for black and brown folks, LGBTQ folks, particularly trans women, um, our undocumented family. How do we build movements across that kind of diversity, particularly when there's a common enemy around what I would say is white nationalism? So has anyone here heard about the actions that have taken place over the past few weeks, shutting down the ICE detention centers and um, Pelosi's office, just that way, that way? And I think last Tuesday, um, over a thousand Jews shut down uh, the, the Department of Homeland Security for five hours. Um, so that, that's a group called uh, Never Again Action. And please someone correct me if I'm inaccurate, but um, so the group uh, Uviento Cosecha, they're an uh, undocumented youth-led organizing group. They call on the Jewish community to put their, uh, to step up basically put their bodies on the line. And the Jewish community basically said, yes. <laughs> and I think six days later, 36 Jews were arrested outside the Elizabethtown deten uh, detention center in, uh, in Elizabethtown, New Jersey. And there have been, I don't know the numbers, but there have been actions across the country uh, these past few weeks. And They've been gaining national attention. Um, I'm not the only one here is, who's heard of it. Um, and a few weeks ago, I'm, I was remembering, and I think they actually talked about this in the film. There was, there were a few frames of the of last year, the group of Jews who got arrested in D.C. I think that was 20, 2018. And one of one of my friends, Gray, he was he was there. He was one of the first. He was the first one arrested. He he went to D.C. and um, also he was the only black man. He was he was the first one arrested. Just putting that putting that out there. And he was. But I was talking to him about that, and he was telling me that before the Jews showed up and started the action, Dreamers had been at the Capitol all day. And it wasn't until the Jews showed up, majority white or white passing, that the cameras came on and um, they started getting attention. And fast forward till today, when Movimiento Cosecha and undocumented activists have been doing this work since the Obama administration, who deported thousands of families has been doing this work already and <laughs> the news pays the news pays attention when a bunch of white folks get arrested for civil disobedience like, um, and am I resp And lately, I'm, I've just been thinking like it's about time <laughs> that the Jews have stepped up. And at the at the Yuba County Detention Center up in Sacramento, um, it's the last ICE detention center in Northern California. I I spoke at the vigil there. And I said to about 300 people, I went up there and I said that Jews, I, I, I said these words, I said that the American Jewish community has been largely absent from the immigration justice movement. And I'm sorry that it has taken us this long to put our bodies on the line largely absent. Well, I go to Kahila in Oakland, who's been doing this work for, yeah, 
um, for a long time, so not completely absent. But when I said that, someone in the audience yelled, he yelled, completely. When I said largely absent, he yelled, completely. I, I ignored it, but it sticks with me. And, but I just, sorry, long, long story short, um, in movement building is showing up even if we're late, and Jews were always late, so I mean. <laughs> So we're on, uh, I mean, we're late because we're on due time or we're late because like, because AOC called the detention centers concentration camps. I don't know, but um, showing up, holding ourselves accountable and not expecting cookies when we get there. Okay, I'm done. All right, y'all, thanks for the questions flowing in. Um, I wanna do like a little public service announcement and then, yeah, about whiteness. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about Farrakhan and there's a bunch of questions about Farrakhan, why we have not, or individuals, or Tamika Mallory or whomever has not just like clearly denounced Farrakhan with like another set of parallel questions about to what extent would be denouncing Farrakhan similar or dissimilar to denouncing Israel vis-a-vis -vis policies, pa policies of Palestine. And so I want to say two things. First of all, um, about our use of the term whiteness, um, depending on what text you're reading, Jews were largely not white in the United States until the GI Bill. And our whiteness, not my whiteness, my mother's whiteness, uh, has always been conditional upon who is black in the United States. And so a very long time, people from Eastern Europe, Armenians, Greeks, Italians, Irish were not white, they were other. And not until other social factors related to race and upward mobility in the United States were created into policy were Jews given the opportunity to choose whiteness. And so not only is whiteness for Jews who have two Ashkenazi parents or who have two European parents conditional, um, it is also a choice to engage in the privileges of whiteness in the United States. And so we use that term fluidly, we use that term with nuance and context, and we don't use that term flippantly. And so I just wanted to like qualify that because there's a bunch of questions about that. You're welcome. So then there's a whole pile of questions about not denouncing Farrakhan and would be denouncing Farrakhan, would it be analogous to denouncing Bibi Netanyahu vis-a-vis -vis how we think about Israel and Palestine. So what I want to say is we're not going to talk about Israel and Palestine today. That's a different panel. Um, and we need like six hours and a break and snacks. <laughs> right? And wine. Um, but... <laughs> Only in California. Um, hang on for just a second, please. Thank you. Um, but I do want to say, like, many of you who have had the privilege of work, I'm a social scientist. I spend a lot of time thinking about our leaders in power, and we spend a lot of time navigating politics and sort of politics of denouncement. And I think we're all clear that I mean, I'm just going to say, Louis Farrakhan is an anti-Semite. He's a misogynist. He's a hateful person. Um, as an African-American, I actually don't think he has that much power. Um, in the black community, he's much more like the Queen of England um, than any other leader. Um, and white folks have given Louis Farrakhan all this power. And white folks have imbued in him this idea that his demonizing creates demons. And I would just suggest that his demonizing doesn't create demons the same way we think like he's gonna say something and then a fleet of black people are gonna go out and be anti-Semitic. It just doesn't happen like that. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, he's a figurehead and he spews foul anti-Semitic hatred things, okay? What's our responsibility as leaders to denounce the content versus the individual? And if we take on a policy of denouncing the individual, to what extent does that policy need to be consistent and parallel in our expression. A policy, you say. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so a policy with NEP. Um, I, I, hard question, I'm gonna do the best I can off the cuff. So, and I'm probably gonna talk, I'm gonna be thinking as I talk, so y'all see if you can follow with me, sorry. Um, so, when I think about Louis Farrakhan and what the nation, and the Nation of Islam, because they are, you know, they're, they're related. And I think about what it was like in the Midwest, St. Louis in particular, in the 1960s and 70s, and in other places uh, where black folks were, and all of the things that plagued us that were put upon us, drugs put in our communities, um, you know, poverty and lack of education and lack of access, um, and some of us being able to gain strides and make, you know, work their way out of certain conditions. Um, and I think about people who had uh, people incarcerated and how the Nation of Islam was a saving grace for so many people who had been incarcerated. My father had been incarcerated and how he came to the Nation of Islam and, and what it brought to his life. Um, and my father and I differed on many, 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 many things. And I loved him. I still love him. And so I, I think that there is a part of me that says to use the language of denouncing the nation of Islam means I denounce my father. Sorry. I said that um, there's a part of me that feels like to use language of denouncing the nation of Islam means I denounce my father. And all of the good that I saw the nation of Islam do inside of the black community. And also some of the damage because you know, it, I mean, it, it, it wasn't all roses. There, there was collateral damage, just like in everything. Um, and I don't feel like Farrakhan, he's just like over there. He talks a lot of shit, excuse me. And it is, the, it is horrific and it is inhumane. And, you know, and so I, I don't see them as the same thing, but I see the connection. And there's something about asking Tamika Mallory, and I go back to her, right, because that's what's on my mind, asking her to use the language of denouncing someone who was the person who came to her aid when her partner was murdered, and the lack of humanity in that, for me personally. Um, and so then I say, couldn't we have had a different ask? Or did we have to have an ask at all? Could it not have just been an acknowledgement that says, Tamika, baby, I'm so sorry for your suffering. And I understand that you can love what he and, and the Nation of Islam did for you, how they protected you, how they took care of your family, how they gave you resources, how they comforted you when you were suffering. And I can also understand that you are not an anti-Semite. And you, uh, you know, you are not a, a, um, a homophobe. Why is it that for, why, why does that have to be the question? Like how, how, how is it that we have to ask ourselves how do these things live together when all of these other things live together? Because I know white Jewish people who have people in their families who hate black folks, let's be clear who have a whole lot of money and voted against me and for their money. I know these people. I went to shul, broke bread. These are my friends and my family. And I never once thought to admonish them or think, question their relationship and their love for me because they did not 
stop that relative or call that rel relative out or push that relative away. They, have, they break bread at Shabbat with that relative every Shabbat. Sometimes it's the mamas and the daddies and the grandparents and the uncles. And so I never would have considered asking them to not be in relationship because I understand that it is complex. And when you love your people and your people are rank, you know, they show up foul, what do you do? You, you call them on their foulness, correct? You talk to them and you constantly, it is a process of having someone who doesn't see another person's humanity. It is a process of taking the scales away from another person's eyes. Because really, they are the only ones that can do it anyway. You can facilitate and help them along the way, but if they're not willing to do this and pull the, the scales away themselves, it's nothing you can do about that. So the whole idea, i sorry, I went a long way to say that the whole idea of Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam and, you know, like at the Women's mar March, it was the fruit of Islam, the um, security uh, team of the Nation of Islam that ushered us to the front. They were front and center right there. Those brothers were bad and fine. <laughs> they were bad and fine and they ushered us and they protected all of us. They didn't just protect, protect the black women, they protected white Jewish women. They protected anybody in our circle. But yes, they were really focused on protecting Tamika because they know the danger she's in constantly. So I don't know if I answered the question. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Lily or Becca, do you want to bite at that? Or I'm gonna, cause I'm gonna do one more and then I'm gonna open it up to the audience. one dimensional like it depends so much on context like individual versus content like I can hold space that um, I'm looking at my notes because that I wasn't prepared for that question but that's a good one um, how I can hold Farrakhan and the work the like the black liberation work that the Nation of Islam has um, has done for so many years versus the content like I can hold that there's a difference between calling out him as an anti-semitism anti-semitic individual versus like the work that they've done where where I can't do that are with individuals such as Trump. Like there is no distinction, differentiating between individual and content um, for the reasons that I think you said, Alana, where the content that white nationalists, neo-Nazis, Trump are actually putting out incites and results in lives lost. Um, and also that, like the power then to instill policy all at all levels, like, that is where the line for me, there's no distinction. I and mean, I wonder to what extent as a society, as a country, like we, I will speak from the I, like all of this is the first time I'm, I'm dealing with it, that I'm having to deal with the question of when do I draw the line between an individual and the content and versus the content. Um, and I wanna just, like, something that's coming up for me that I really find is important is at the beginning of the film when Tamika starts her speech by saying to all of you, or this is the first time that you're experiencing this, welcome to my world. Like that actually resonates with me. Uh, and the way I navigate this world as sometimes people think I'm white, sometimes people think I'm something, oh, are you mixed, what are you? And all of that, I have to just name that how I've navigated in my 35, almost 36 years of life is very different in the way that a darker skinned person, a black woman nav or a black person navigates this world. And so. I got called in and I'm glad for, and like that was actually a learning, a learning, um, a, a learning point for me. And so, and, and the question is, and what do I do with it now? Like, how do I move forward with that? Um, what does it mean to be in relationship, to be aware of like, oh, individual versus content? What is the work that I want to pursue moving forward? Um, and how am I going to do that in a relationship with, with whom? So. A last question and then we'll take a couple from the audience. And there are two, a group of questions that are about how to be incredible allies across boundaries of difference. And also a group of questions that are like, I'm part of a multiracial Jewish family, okay? 
and either we're white parents with kids of color or we're in a family that has multiracial people in it and what can we be doing to strengthen and support identity um, particularly from an Ashkenazi Jewish perspective like I said when we started at least a million of our 7.2 million Jewish people in the United States are people of color and the fastest growing population are our young people and we trend along the same diversity lines as the greater US, and someday the United States Jewish community will be a, a majority people of color too. And so this isn't just like a great curiosity to explore as a group, like this is training right now, <laughs> right? To be ready to, to be who we already are. What can we tell our colleagues in the audience, our family in the audience about being allies, about providing support, about strengthening identity, so we can be the strong, multiracial Jewish community we already are. I think, Ilana, what you said at the end is that we already are. I, a lot of the times I hear um, um, Jewish institutions saying, oh, we need to be more inclusive and wel wel be more welcoming towards these people or that people or be more inclusive so that we welcome everyone. But just like you said, Jews of color, we've been here and we've all and we've always been here. <laughs> um, and something that I'm going to quote um, Yvila McCoy uh, once offered me the very wise advice to, I quote, take up space, end quote. <laughs> um, yeah, and <laughs> no, seriously, um, I just remember my, um, my first high holidays at Kahila was two years ago, and does anyone know the poet Aurora Levins Morales? Oh, is she here? Okay, probably not. Um, <laughs> and I remember it, it, I had just moved back to California and exp I was shul shopping for high holidays as uh, someone who was newly observant and back in the Bay Area. And she was helping lead services and I saw her and I had known of her work um, and then she was reading her poem and I didn't know who she was and I was thinking to myself, that reminds me of the poem by Aurora Lemons Morales. <laughs> and, and then it was Aurora Lemons Morales and, and when I came up for an aliyah later, I saw she was wearing her talis and um, she's Aurora Lemons Morales, she's a Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican Jew, Jew of color and she got the achiote, which is a, it's a face, it comes from a plant. It's this red face paint that the Taino people wear, and I still remember it. She was wearing the achiote face paint with her talus, and it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. And the, the and what I thought of was just of what Yvila McCoy said: take up space and be visible, and. Um, at the Women's March when we were all there, just so visible, so very scary, but <laughs> he overcame it, just so visible as Jewish women of color, where previously people, according to someone on Twitter, didn't know that we existed, but that's just Twitter. Um, like taking up space doesn't, o doesn't it, it isn't only empowering like for myself, showing up to the Women's March in Atalus was, I can't even put it into words. Um, I regularly go to protests with my, with my Atalus on because it is an act of marching, what, what do you call it, praying with my feet. Thank you. Um, and being visible not only for myself, but to show to show my whole self because like I said earlier, I'm not half of anything and I am one of I am one with the Jews, I am one with all my other identities. 
and I forget what the question was, but I feel like... Um, I, think, I think that's it. Um, it's a, so the, the question, sorry, I, these things. Um, so the question is about the multiracial In, in relationship to family too, right? Was there something in there? Okay, so like I, 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 used to, I used to have a daycare. I had a kosher daycare for babies zero to two. And I have to tell you that um, when you have four babies to one adult, there's something that it is alchemy to, to make this thing happen and work. But the people always say, how did you do that? Because every one of those babies, I saw my babies in those babies. So I loved those babies, just like they were mine. And I knew those babies, probably, if not as well as, you know, like pretty much as well as the parents did, right? Because I had them all day. And so I went, I would do things like um, put them all in the, in the minivan. And, you know, if somebody wasn't feeling particularly well or one parent, I remember at one point she was just missing her baby just missing her baby, so I piled all the babies in the car. We went down to her job. I called her and said, we're outside. She came out and got the baby and nursed her baby. I took the other babies to the park, and we came back and got other baby, and then we went home. So I, I'm telling that story to say, for me, at the very beginning of all things, I have to, I have to let myself fall in love with you. I have to be willing to fall in love with you in order to care for you in a way that elevates me, really, like I have to just own it. It, it lifts me, it heals me, um, it opens me, it is my prayer. That is how I worship Hashem, is being in love with my people. And so I begin when I think about how, what do I tell people about how to build, like I could, I could probably drop some theory, you know what I'm saying? Like I could probably go off into something like that, but that's not what's, where, where it starts for me. It starts for me one-to-one -one looking in your face and seeing your beauty and wanting to be in love with you. And if you can do that with other people, if you are willing to fall in love with the people you don't even know, and be of service to the people you don't even know and you might not even particularly like, necessarily. You have no idea how many people I have said, mm, I ain't really sure about them. And the next thing, because I put that aside and then I opened myself to be in relationship with them, they are some of the so, friends to this day. Now don't go tell them that that's how it started, but in actuality I have, I have several relationships where I was the one holding the funk because of the way their face looked in a particular moment or I heard their voice or the way they sat or whatever it was about me feeling what I was going through in that moment I prejudged that other person and then when I let that go and I said Tonda you were being absolutely ridiculous that person could save your life that person could be the most delightful and they were now sometimes they weren't, but some, you know, most of the times they are, right? And so it's something about being willing to be in love. For me personally, my activism starts right there. First with myself. I have had to learn how to be in love with myself in all my funk and glory, right? Like I've just had to learn how to hold that I am magnificent. And so when I see you, I see the magnificence of you in you coming back to me. When I see your babies, your babies remind me of my babies. So, yeah, that's, that's all I got. Yeah, that's all I got. Um, that was so beautiful. And someday if I have babies, I want you to take them. <laughs> um, What's coming up for me is, of course, just affirming that the Jewish community is multiracial. I mean, there are, there are three of us on this panel right now with even though we share the, the identity of Jewish women of color, how different our experience is on a day-to-day -day basis, both within the Jewish community and, um, and throughout. So just to affirm that. And um, 
the way I understand what's happening both in our country is, is a, either, a ref, I don't know if it's a reflection of the Jewish community, but I mean, we're also, I grew up with the term minority. That's how, that's in school. That's what we were told because of course, whiteness was centered. And so since I didn't, I, I was not part of the dominant culture, the dominant language, well, yeah, the dominant culture, then I was other. Um, and I was grouped into a minority category and it took a really long time to understand what does that even mean. Um, so we're seeing it play out nationally when we have 11 million people, when really what's happening here, we have 11 million people who don't fit into this whiteness center, um, who are withheld their right to vote, to be a citizen, um, because in doing so, what does that mean? That means our, our voting, like the, we're gonna see such a shift in our, um, in the results of elections. And of course, white nationalism is a hold onto white political power, make no mistake of that. Um, and so then the question for me is then, what can I, what is my piece of the pie? What is my piece of the, of the puzzle in doing the work in the Jewish community that can reflect outward? Um, and it actually means not centering whiteness in the Jewish community. It means like, um, what is the work that I need to do with other, other Jews of color like myself? Um, how is it to center our needs and not just to be a, a, in a white space or in a white uh, Jewish organization have a two or three Jews of color on staff? That's not, it's not quite that. It's so much more of when, a, like when white culture is no longer centered and when we are centered where I, my cultures, my languages, both the languages that I speak and, and others are then now centered. Um, what does that look like in, in a space, in a group, and how is that reflection, reflected um, in the family, in the home life? Um, I come from a multi, like a mixed culture family, two, recept two different religions, um, and I saw how it didn't actually work very well. Um, and so it's like, I'm in a place in my life, I'm in a point in my life where I want to take those lessons learned, and what would that look like if I can bring that to the Jewish community? Um, yeah. And I wrote down this question in the middle of the movie, which is, how close have you been to losing your freedom? How close have you been to losing your freedom? And so, just to try to like bring some closure and sum up the conversation, and really thinking about the questions um, that came in around raising our young people to be free and to be in our identities. I think we have to go deep about how close each one of us is with losing our freedom and our own understanding of what those freedoms are. If we've ever lost a job and we didn't know how we were gonna pay our next mortgage bill or our next rent bill, that's scary. When we lose our job and we have no health care, that's terrifying. When we risk losing our mother because she might be deported, when we risk losing our sons or daughters because they might be murdered, and the film and this conversation gives us an opportunity to understand ourselves within a context of being in relationship to not only each other, but to the vulnerabilities of loss and losing each other and what the cost might be, which is not only our interpersonal sense of self, our ability to be whole, our ability to be in our power so that we can be part of a movement that's about our collective liberation, but it's about our collective liberation and what it means to transcend this very difficult moment that requires all of us to be deeply engaged and entirely committed. And so while this film was an invitation to talk about Tamika Mallory, to talk about anti-Semitism, it was really an invitation to look beyond Tamika Mallory and to look beyond allegations of anti-Semitism, to look at what it means for us to come together as a collective, what it means for us to come together as a community and to understand ourselves better so that when we can walk out the door, we can not only work together, but we can advocate on behalf of one another. And so I know that I can speak on behalf of Lely and Tonda and Becca when I say that we walk out of this door in community with all of you, with each other, and committed to our collective liberation because without it, none of us will be free. And each one of us deserves to be whole and to be free. 
And so with that, I thank you and we thank you and go out in peace. <laughs>